statement, the member from Carlton. Madam Speaker, two weeks ago I toured the Ottawa Carlton Plowing Match hosted by Dave and Bonnie Ostrom on their farm in Ashton, along with Bill Tupper and Rich McDonald, and many more from the Ottawa Carlton Plowmen's Association. Plowing matches have been a part of Carlton's agricultural history for well over a century. They're a great opportunity for farmers to put on display their plowing skills and teach the importance of soil conservation. It was a pleasure to once again attend the VIP plowing match, and although I didn't win, I know that uh, hopefully in future years my furrows will be straight enough to win first prize at the Ottawa Carleton plowing match. And just in a couple of weeks, Madam Speaker, Campville will be hosting the International Plowing Match and Rural Expo. It is the biggest plowing match of its kind in North America, and it's a wonderful celebration of agriculture and rural living. Madam Speaker, I'm proud to be part of a government that supports our agricultural industry, especially when the pandemic first hit us. In fact, back in March, the Richmond Agricultural Society received a grant of $55,500 from the Ontario Trillium Foundation to ensure that they are able to pay the utilities rent, salaries, insurance, and more, as well as renovate and remodel their fairground office. I encourage all MPPs to attend the international plowing match in support of Ontario's agricultural sector this month. I'll be cheering for all contestants, especially those from Carleton. I know you'll do us all proud. Thank you very much. The member from Spadina, Fort York. Yeah, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. It's the first day back to school, and this morning I was standing in front of Jean Lum Public School and Bishop McDonnell Catholic School in City Place, welcoming students and parents, and it was so nice to see the smiles on the children's faces. And I want to thank principals Judith Kramer and Jamie D. Girolamo uh, for all the, and all of the staff at those schools and all the schools across Spadina Fort York for all of the work you've done over the summer to get our schools ready for our students. Parents, I encourage you to get involved in your school council. I was the co-chair of Deucin Street Public School uh, when my kids were there, and together we organized fun fairs and arts and music and tech activities for the kids. We helped with sports teams, and we advocated for the funding that our schools need. I was speaking with a teacher this morning, and he says he's really looking forward to the extracurriculars, but they need some funding. They need funding for sports uniforms, for equipment, for transportation, and for supply teachers uh, to, to take over when the teachers uh, go out to coach a team. The CCPA uh, shows that when you take inflation into account, that uh, school funding in Ontario has fallen an average of $800 per student per year during this government's first term in office. In order for students to have the kind of school year they need, we need the government to restore that funding that's been lost, and we need to make a fair, them to make a fair deal with education workers. I urge the provincial government work with the teachers and work with the parents to ensure that our students have a great and full school year. Thank you. Natalie, a member from Burlington. Thank you, Speaker. This Saturday, September 10th, is World Suicide Prevention Day. Bringing much needed attention to an issue that claims the lives of more than 4,000 Canadians each year, the intention of World Suicide Prevention Day is to destigmatize de conversations about mental health. Today in Canada, 10 people will end their lives. Up to 200 others will attempt suicide. For each death by suicide, it is estimated that 100 people are deeply affected by their loss. Today in Canada, 10 deaths by suicide will leave up to 1,000 people in a state of bereavement. In 2017, I was one of those people twice. If you or someone you know is in crisis, call 911 or visit an emergency department. For non-emergencies, call 211 to connect with local services. You can also visit ontario.ca slash mental health to learn about the free virtual call and walk-in resources that are available to all Ontarians. For Indigenous people across Canada, the Hope for Wellness line is a mental health 
Counseling and Crisis Intervention Service. We must educate all Canadians on risk factors and warning signs of suicide, just as we have done with physical illnesses like cancer and heart disease. There is no health without mental health. Windsor West. Thank you, Speaker. I rise today to speak about the proposed Ojibwe National Urban Park in my riding of Windsor West. The people of my community want to protect local endangered species and natural heritage areas, aid flood mitigation efforts, create publicly accessible green space, and encourage ecotourism in Windsor Essex. Tomorrow, Motion 1 will be up for debate, which, if passed, would begin the process of negotiation leading to the transfer of ownership of the Ojibwe Prairie Provincial Nature Reserve to Parks Canada, a necessary process in the creation of Ojibwe National Urban Park, something my community wants to happen. Windsor Port Authority has signed an MOU to transfer lands to Parks Canada, and the City of Windsor is in the process of transferring municipally owned land as well. The land for the proposed urban park is home to hundreds of endangered species that rely on migration through surrounding local parks for survival. It serves not only as a home and larger ecosystem to these species, but also provides mitigation of flooding due to climate change and natural heritage areas that our community and visitors can enjoy. Ojibwe National Urban Park has broad support at all levels of government, including a bill by my federal colleague Brian Massey, which passed second reading in the House of Commons and is supported by MPs across party lines. There's significant support from local Indigenous and environmental groups, including Caldwell First Nation, Walpole Island First Nation, and Wildlands League. I ask that all members of this House support Motion 1, respect the wishes of the people in my community, truly work towards reconciliation by honouring the wishes of Caldwell First Nation, and protect green spaces in Windsor-Essex. Thank you. Member Statements. The member for Sault Ste. Marie. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The Agua Canyon Tour Train is a world-class attraction in my riding of Sault Ste. Marie. This one-day, 228-mile scenic rail adventure begins in the beautiful paper mill district of the Sioux. Made possible in part through a $5 million investment through the Northern Ontario Heritage Fund, a charming new train station was designed and built to mimic the surrounding sandstone buildings of the historic St. Mary's Paper Company, which was previously the Sault Ste. Marie Pulp and Paper Company. Adding to this great tourist destination, the station hosts an outfitter store, a craft brewery, and a restaurant. But back to the Agua Canyon tour train, Mr. Speaker. The train leaves the station bright and early and heads north for a four-hour, 114-mile excursion showcasing the rugged beauty that is exclusive to the eastern shores of Lake Superior. The Northern Ontario wilderness begins to unfold with mixed forests of the Canadian Shield popping with autumn colours and the beauty of many northern lakes and rivers. These are the same rugged landscapes and majestic views that inspired the Group of Seven to create some of Canada's most notable artwork. You enter the Agua Canyon tour, uh, train uh, begins to descend into the canyon at mile 102. The rail line hugs the top of the canyon wall, and you descend 500 feet over the next 10 miles to the floor of the Agua Canyon. Upon arrival at the uh, park, riders have the opportunity to have a pip picnic or uh, climb some steps uh, to watch the uh, panoramic views on the lookout trail. Uh, randomly uh, be able to uh, go through all these different trails through Be uh, Black Beaver Falls, Brighter Vale Falls. It is an incredible, incredible excursion, and I encourage everyone to come out and enjoy the fall colours on the uh, on the tour train. All aboard, uh, Mr. Speaker. Member statements. Member for Ottawa Centre. Well, thank you, Speaker. Uh, as members of this house may know. Colleagues, uh, myself and four other colleagues, embarked on what we call the social assistance diet for the next two weeks. And I want to say from the top speaker in my remarks this morning to this House, it is not about us. It is an expression of frustration from me personally and my colleague from watching our neighbours suffer for four years. There hasn't been a day in this place, I'm told, when someone hasn't stood up and talked about how people are suffering in our communities before our very eyes. 
And when I heard the Premier say this week that a 5% increase is fantastic and unprecedented and adequate, I ask any one of us to follow what we're doing, to join us in what we're doing, and ask if $57 extra a month is actually going to help someone living in legislative poverty. I'm going to ask us also to consider, as we do this two-week journey together, that there are countries in this world that actually say there's a minimum level of income, and those countries that have basic incomes in their communities have healthier communities. They spend less on health care and correctional and police services. People have a dignified opportunity to live and be their fullest selves. That's what we're asking for in this place. We're asking for an awareness that compassion is not only an ethical consideration, it's an economic consideration, it's a respect consideration, and I will not go into this house for one more day without making at least an attempt to walk a mile in someone else's shoes, and I welcome the Premier and the Minister responsible to do it with us. Member Statements, the member for Glengarry Prescott-Russell. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you to offer me the opportunity to speak in this House. I hope that everyone uh, took advantage of the long weekend for Labour Day. And for all students, uh, I wish you well on this beginning of the school year. We've seen signs for municipal, municipal candidates, uh, and I'd like to congratu congratulate the, those candidates. I know that it's important to have people that represent uh, citizens, and the Municipal Council is closest to the people. I'd like to wish them a great uh, election and good luck to all candidates on the 24th of October. On another note, we've lost a few colleagues that were involved in the municipal sector recently. I'd like to offer my condolences to uh, the family of Marc Clément that w passed away. Thursday, the 1st of September, at 56 years old. Marc was a director of public works for Prescott Russell during the last 27 years. He had over 30 years of experience in the municipal council. He was not only a colleague, but a friend. My condolences also to the family of Raymond Fredette of the municipality of Alfred Plantagenet. They passed away on the 31st of August. He served uh, the municipality of Alfred Plantagenet. He served a number of years as a municipal councillor. And to conclude, I'd like to also thank all of the people that worked and that still work for our citizens. Thank you. Merci. Member statements. Next, we have the member for Ottawa South. Thank you very much, Speaker. Speaker, more than a week ago, um, Bill 7 rocketed through this legislature without any attempt at consultation or public input. And at the same time, I listened to the Premier muse about $1,800 a day, not being right, not being fair. Respectfully to the Premier, you know, saying that you think something's not right and not fair when you have the power to change things. Well, it doesn't amount to very much. And the threat of the huge hospital bill that coerced Deanna Henry of Ottawa to go to a place where she didn't want to go, a place where she didn't feel safe, is just not right. So for the Premier, what he needs to do is make his words match his actions, or his actions match his words. So motion number 14 is on the order paper, and it calls on the government essentially to not to ensure that no patient waiting for transfer would be charged more than the copay in Ontario's long-term care homes. The Premier has the power to do this. It's the fair and reasonable thing to do. It's the right thing to do. I call on this government to do this. Speaker, displaying empathy, telling people you feel for them, but not taking the action necessary to mitigate their pain, their suffering, that's just not right. Thank you, Speaker. Member Statements, the member for Peterborough Kawartha. Thank you, Speaker. I want to talk about something that's close to my heart and the hearts of many in my community. September is Guide Dog Awareness Month. Mr. Speaker, a guide dog is not just an animal. They're also the eyes for someone who has a visual impairment. 
They enable safe movement throughout our communities, from crossing the streets to buying groceries or even walking their kids to school. I want to recognize a constituent of mine who I also consider a friend. Jason King works tirelessly as a member for the people of the Council for People with Disabilities to educate others. He runs the program called Time in My Shoes. Jason and his guide dog Zani, yes, that's from the Blue Jays, visited my office last year and put my staff through the Tim's program. We briefly experienced what it was like to navigate our world without eyesight, hearing, or speech. To paraphrase Jason, it's an eye-opener to see the world from the perspective of a blind man and his guide dog. Guide Dog Awareness Month is more than just a reminder. It's a call to action for all of us to learn more, listen with compassion, and to build a more accessible and inclusive Ontario for generations to come. I encourage everyone to reach out to the Council for People with Disabilities and experience time in my shoes so we can build on the good work of the Canadian National Institute for the Blind and our great Minister of Seniors and Accessibility, Raymond Cho. Well said, sir. <laughs> Member statements? Still one more? Yep. Member for Brampton North. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Speaker. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Uh, after navigating two long years of COVID restrictions on festivals and events, the World of Jazz Festival celebrates its sixth annual festival with a triumphant return to downtown Brampton on September 10th and 11th. This two-day music festival will play host to more than 100 musicians, 17 ensembles, and eight venues, featuring some of Canada's finest jazz musicians as well as local Brampton musicians, students, and emerging artists. The festival hosts restaurant and community performances, a late night jam session, a family fun zone, food vendors, and wraps up on September 11th with two sessions hosting non-stop free music from 1 to 8 p.m. at Gage Park. The festival overcame the obstacles of COVID-19 and was able to pivot to both live and virtual performances over the last two years without cancelling. The World of Jazz Festival is hosted by Be Jazz, a not-for-profit organization in the city of Brampton curating performances, education, philanthropy of jazz music and its musicians. Annually, Be Jazz curates over 100 performances, compensating nearly 300 musicians, with over 70% of those residing in Brampton. They've created a scene and an ecosystem for music and musicians that has simply never existed before in Brampton, and their visibility in our community has allowed their stylistic programming vision to expand beyond the jazz genre, hence the World of Jazz title. Uh, the, the World of Jazz received a Reconnect Ontario grant in 2022 uh, and thank the Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport for this honour. Uh, please visit uh, worldofjazz.ca for the schedule, September 10th and 11th. Uh, I know the Minister of Women's and uh, Economic and Social Development will be there. I'll be there as well. Come on down to Brampton. Let's have a good time. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes our member statements for this morning.